2022 is natuurlijk het jaar van de oorlog van Poetin tegen Oekraïne. De onafhankelijke pers onder Poetin in Rusland is vermorzeld. Voor Russische journalisten staat er zelfs een gevangenisstraf van 15 jaar... op het publiceren van het woord oorlog als het gaat om Oekraïne. Onafhankelijke journalisten die sloegen op de vlucht, ook naar Nederland. In Amsterdam maakt de Russische televisiezender TV Rain... voortaan zijn uitzendingen die in Rusland te bekijken zijn via YouTube... En daarnaast maken gevluchte Russische journalisten vanuit Amsterdam de krant Moscow Times. En zo is Amsterdam de stad van de onafhankelijke Russische media... waar presentatoren van naam en faam hun programma's maken. Bij mij het Russisch-Oekraïnse echtpaar en journalisten Michael Fischman en Julia Taratuta. Welkom, both to you. En ook welkom Dirk Sauer, de uitgever van de Moscow Times. Julia, let's start with you... Uh, You are from Ukraine. Your parents are living in Ukraine. You are married to Michael. He is from Russia. And now you are working here in Amsterdam, anchoring the news for TV Rain. How difficult is this situation for you? Because you also have a daughter of five years old in Amsterdam now. It's rather difficult. I was born in Ukraine. My parents are still there. Um, you know, the, I lived in Vinnytsia for 20 years. And I lived in Russia for also 20 years. And uh, you remember in, um, on the 14th of July, um, I, the center of my town of, um, of, of Vinnytsia was shelled by a Russian army. And it was a horrible moment in my life. Uh, it was rather safe in Vinnytsia. And um, a lot of people were evacuated to the mm. town and I, I felt as if my parents were rather safe, but when it was shelled, the situation changed. And you know, it was the exact place I studied in. It was the place when I studied in my university, and it was a place uh, five minutes from my home. Uh, so 27 people were killed, died, and three, three children among them. And uh, you know, it was a car parking, and uh, the people who burned down, uh, who burned down the life. Mm. Um, and it was terrible. And now you are here in Amsterdam and you're reporting on everything that is happening in Ukraine, yeah. in Russia. And you know, my parents live without light and it is turned off uh, three or four times a day. It's difficult to live in these yeah. circumstances. Let's see how the situation is right now in Ukraine, in Russia, uh, because we're going to talk to a former BBC journalist and since the start of the war reporting independently from Kyiv. John Sweeney, can you hear me from Kyiv? Welcome to Buitenhof. Hi, hi Swan, I can hear you perfectly. John, uh, you've been on our show before. You just came back yesterday from uh, the front lines in Bakhmut, where there is heavy fighting going on in the trenches and they call this city now the Bakhmut meat grinder. Could you tell us what you have heard and seen in Bakhmut? Yeah, so um, we were there Saturday. I've, and I've been there twice before. Uh, I spent about four or five days um, in Bakhmut in August and then on a one day trip in, in October. This time it was far worse. The destruction to the city It was a city of around about 100,000 people, and now um, it's empty. Um, there is the number of people uh, we actually saw was about uh, maybe 10. Um, and people who live on the ground. As you can hear from the soundtrack, the, uh, the shelling was continuous. Um, uh, uh, this is an artillery duel. The Russians essentially are to the east. They've got a ridge and they're firing into the city and firing at the Ukrainian army. And um, in the last week or so, uh, the Russians have done very well. According to the Ukrainians, what's happened is that they have, their tactics have got significantly better. And what they're doing is using these, um, uh, the new conscripts and also people, I think, uh, convicts, uh, pushing them forward in human wave offences, and, and, and the Ukrainians um, are sort of machine gunning these poor Russian dead meat. One has to feel sorry for them, even though what they're doing is wrong and evil. But um, then they're using special forces, the Russians, dressed in black, moving uh, in small numbers at night. And as a result, they managed to take four or five hamlets to the south and east of Bakhmut. 
The Ukrainians have adapted. They sent in their special forces. And basically, the, the city itself is still on the Ukrainian hands. But it felt desperate. When I was there, the shelling was absolutely continuous. I did a, a little um, a video diary for my... It's continuous. And this is something to when the, 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 you know, our or my grandfathers, both of whom who fought in the First World War, your great grandfathers, um, may have recognized from the First World War. This is like the Somme. And there are pictures. We didn't, we didn't get into the trenches on this trip. I was in the trenches in, um, in August when it was a quiet day. But now the lives of ordinary Ukrainians, is, it's like hell. Yeah. And this is, this is John, this is Bakhmut. And then we also heard last night that Russian drones have uh, attacked electricity stations near Odessa and that one and a half million people in Odessa are now without electricity. How desperate is the situation there and how's the situation in Kyiv where you are? So um, what's happened is that the Ukrainians have got better at shooting the Russian cruise missiles and the Iranian drones out of the sky. October the 10th, uh, there was a big swarm attack and um, four Russian cruise missiles got through, killing about 19 people and knocking off the power plant. The la latest attack, none of the Russian missiles got to Kyiv. So there is power and light in Kyiv. But where I was in Kramatorsk, uh, which is close to but, um, uh, uh, Bakhmut, um, there was, uh, the power was iffy, it would come on and it would go off again and there was no heating in the flat I was. So I spent the last two days, um, until I got back to Kyiv, freezing, freezing. And actually, I'm, I'm quite chubby. And, um, you know, I've got all my kits on. I, I wore my, my lucky orange hat the whole time when I was, uh, when I was asleep. But um, for millions and millions of people, life is becoming unbearable. And this is part of the new Russian strategy. Now, I, um, I've got two proper Russian speakers on the show, but it's... The guy who's behind this is the new general in charge, General Armageddon, General um, Surovkin, if I got the pronunciation right. Michael uh, Surovkin. 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 Okay. Here you go, John. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I start, anyway, I'm going to call him General Armageddon. What he's done is he has brought the war to the Ukrainian people in a pitiless and brutal way. And to some measure, it's effective because people are much more worried about power and lights and without, you know, and, you know um, there's a slight fall here in Keith, but if it's minus three, minus five, you freeze. Yeah. However, the other consequence of this barbaric and pitiless and inhumane strategy is that it's helped the West understand they really, really got to support the Ukrainians. So I think that uh, General Armageddon has got a tactical victory, maybe, or a tactical improvement of the Russian position. But strategically, they've made a mistake. It's much, much harder now to see the route that President Macron of France wants, which is some kind of accommodation, some off-ramp for Putin, some kind of deal. The more barbaric the Russians are, the harder that is. Right. And I think... Strategically, the Russians have made a mistake. Yeah. John, you have been in the country, in Kyiv, and traveling there since the beginning of the war. Uh, I follow you on Twitter, John Sweeney uh, Roar. Uh, you make films, you have every day, you have um, a report there. And you wrote a book on Putin as well, uh, The Killer in the Kremlin. Um, this this uh, situation now with President Putin, what do you think? Is, is there any victory inside for him, or is this... Uh, dead on arrival, what he's doing in Ukraine. The, the tragedy is that because his grip on the machinery of fear in Russia is so strong, that even though everybody with half a brain can see that this war is stupid and wrong and Russia is losing it, it doesn't really impact on him because no one dare say this is wrong. If you do say that, you may end up dead or in prison or poisoned or you fall out of the window. So, so for the moment, like, I mean, the numbers are terrible, but um, it could be the Russians by Christmas will have lost 100,000 soldiers. They've lost, their, I mean, they've lost their 
the good name of Russia is is, is dead for for generations. This war is as, as bad for Russia's reputation as the Second World War is for Germany's reputation. Having said all that, for the moment, Putin is strong in the Kremlin, and until such time as either there is some kind of coup inside the Kremlin or there is some kind of revolution, then we're stuck with Putin. And it seems the only way to end this is to stop the Russian killing machine, is to help the Ukrainians give them the heavy metal and the money and the support right. they need. And, um, and, and, and then Russia might think again about this, this evil monster who's, who's ruining not just Ukraine, but also Russia too. John Sweeney from Kyiv, thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. Thanks and good luck over there. Thank you. Uh, hier in de studio mijn gasten, uh, twee een Russisch Oekraïens echtpaar, Michael Fischman en Julia Taratuta. En ook Dirk Sauer. Uh, you will have translation. Uh, Dirk, uh, hoe luister jij naar het commentaar vanuit Kiev van John Sweeney? Ja, het is, uh, hij heeft helemaal gelijk. Het is een, een, een drama, natuurlijk verschrikkelijk wat daar gebeurt. Maar het, het heeft ook een verschrikkelijk impact op Rusland zelf. Hm. Um, het gekke is natuurlijk dat het dagelijks leven, zeker in de grote steden, op dit moment eigenlijk gewoon doorgaat. Ja, wij hebben nog collega's in Moskou. En uh, als ik die spreek, zeggen ze, ja, als je het niet wil, dan, kan je daar, dan merk je er niks van. Als je gewoon uh, je niet met de politiek benoemt, niet naar de televisie kijkt, dan is uh, eigenlijk niet zoveel veranderd. Hand, ja. Voor wie er wel veel veranderd is, is voor de gast hier aan tafel, Michael. Uh, you came to the Netherlands in August, but you left Russia, both of you, you left Russia in March. And uh, you have a special status now since Friday in Russia. What happened? Uh, yes, this Friday I have been labeled a foreign agent personally. What does it mean, foreign agent? Um, foreign may agent means that um, uh, officially that I'm under, uh, I either receive money from uh, some foreign sources or I'm under some foreign influence and that uh, defines uh, what I do my professional my, my prof professionally so what I'm doing on my shows is defined uh, by who am I paid for it or are you an enemy just, of the state now is that that, what, uh, moral, that means yes but politically yeah. this is officially but politically it means it means labeling uh, me personally this time as an outcast as a as a pariah in, in inside inside russia let's talk about what you're doing here uh, tv rain uh, existed already in moscow naturally was very popular had a very young audience how is it for you guys to to work from here as journalists and anchors uh, reporting on your own country from Amsterdam. I can't even imagine what that must be for a journalist. How is that? Well, it's uh, in terms of uh, conditions, it's uh, very, very comfortable. And we have a great, uh, great studio now mm -hmm. in, in, in Amsterdam. It's tiny, not big, not as large as, as, as our uh, office has been uh, in, in Moscow, but still it's very um, convenient, convenient. And Amsterdam is a friendly city on earth. Um, yeah, probably, but professionally and uh, and per psychologically for us, it's of course very, very, very different. Can you describe how difficult it is? Professionally, it means for uh, for, for 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 TV Rain as a, as a network that TV Rain relied heavily, being in Russia, on live reporting from Russia. Would it be a street rally? Would it be a political trial? Would it be um, whatever it would be? Um, reporters would be there reporting live. Covering it live from 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 the scene. It's no, impossible. It's, it's no longer it's no longer possible. You yeah. cannot report for for TV Rain from uh, from Russia openly because you put put your your freedom at risk immediately. Let's have a look at a little bit of uh, TV Rain or Dost as it's called in Russia. For 12 years, we remained the only independent news channel in Russia. We had to leave, forced out of the country by new repressive laws after the first week of the war. Our freedom crushed by the authorities. 
How was it uh, to leave Moscow? Can you describe the evening in March when you decided, the two of you with your daughter, okay, we can't stay here anymore? You know, it, it was a late night because uh, Misha was on air uh, when uh, the TV rain was blocked uh, in Russia. He was working live. That yeah, evening. he was, was live on air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I had, I think, a few hours to pack our things into the luggage. Uh, because we were bought uh, a ticket by relatives to, so that we could uh, leave on the next morning. Uh, it was several hours, a few hours, and I packed three suitcases and we left. It was unpleasant and uh, our friends, our... Uh, I don't know how to, how to explain it to you, but uh, we were even advised not to stay at home that night. I, I don't think, maybe it was a panic, and, but we didn't want to check. Um, and all the journalists left uh, Moscow and they didn't want to check how to return and how to stay at the city because uh, there were rumors uh, that the police would come to the office, to our office, TV Rain, and uh, the police would come to the, to the apartments. We left and we started to live in some other countries. Yeah. Was there, was there uh, that danger that you would be arrested and that you could maybe go to jail for, for the reporting you did on TV Rain? Be, um, when, uh, during the first week, uh, week of the war, the war started on February 24th, that, uh, we, le we left, it was March 2nd, I guess, early, early morning. During the first days, um, the, the authorities, the government, um, the par parliament introduced new legislation, which would, uh, new legis repressive legislation, which would uh, basically punish, uh, calling, even calling this war a war with years in jail. Yeah. And so, so that, um, and when the TV rain was, sh was shut down, the website was shut down when I was li live on air, that immediately meant that from, from, from next morning, that danger is upon us. Right. I understood that it had such a heavy impact on you personally that you even lost your voice in the beginning. Uh, my voice, it's um, more of a... Um, my own personal identity uh, kind of uh, trauma that uh, um, that I mean I mean by that that's when when I was I'm I'm a political journalist with more than 20 years of uh, of uh, background professional background as a political um, editor uh, TV TV host whatever whatever I wrote a book um, and book I, on Boris Nemtsov the politi uh, yes, politician who yes, was and killed it's, right, and it's this uh, and it's story of of Russia of right. new Russia starting from from late 80s until he was murdered in 2015. And, um, and for me, always what I did was also about me. I was always part of my own story. Uh, when I did my uh, shows every, every Friday night in, in Moscow, I shared all the risks. Uh, it was probably the sharpest political show on Russian YouTube. And I knew, understood that I have this right to speak because I share all these risks living under tyranny. Mm. And that made me understand that my voice makes difference, it means something. And when I left uh, Russia, first time in, in these 20, 20 years, I, I don't bear this, this risk anymore, I'm not in danger anymore, I'm safe. But what does it mean for uh, what, I, what I do? Do I have still this right to talk to Russians because they still are there, they are still under tyranny and I'm safe? Do I have this right to talk to them and to, um, to, to, to present, to, to do what I did before. That's an, still an open question. Yeah. Let's have a look at what you did in Russia, because you were not only anchoring from a studio like this one, but you were on the street, uh, reporting live, uh, doing stuff uh, when there was a demonstration, for example, in Moscow, like once, this one. Once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> давили вперед. При этом действительно я такое по крайней мере еще не видел раньше. This was in 2019, uh, Michael, but people now are very afraid to go out on the street to demonstrate, right? Uh, yes, since then, uh, since then the grip uh, became even even harder mm -hmm. and uh, and well, now, back then in 2019, you could, you could end up in, in prison, receive, get two, three years. Yeah. Now, 
now those who, who take out to the streets and protest openly, they get seven, eight, nine years of years. Michael, you were the editor-in-chief of the Moscow Times, uh, the krant die jij hebt opgericht, uh, Dirk Sauer. Jullie kennen elkaar heel erg goed. Uh, daarna is hij naar TV Rain gegaan. En nu zit zowel TV Rain als de Moscow Times in Amsterdam. Ja, um, <coughs> wij zijn natuurlijk ook uh, hals over kop uh, vertrokken uh, een paar dagen nadat uh, Michel is vertrokken. En wat ik zag is dat ja, die journalisten... die, die Zaten overal op kamertjes, Istanbul, Tel Aviv, uh, Georgië, uh, eh, overal verspreid. Um, en uh, geïsoleerd. En uh, ja, wisten ook eigenlijk niet meer op zo goed wat ze moesten doen. Want, want hun, uh, in het geval van TV Rain, het was afgesloten. Uh, in het geval van de Moscow Times verscheen niet meer. Dus uh, er was een enorme urgentie om weer journalisten bij elkaar te krijgen... en ze weer aan de gang te krijgen, zodat ze uh, hun werk weer konden doen. En werkt het vanuit hier? Is er een publiek voor Moscow Times en TV Rain... dat in, de, in Rusland kan zien wat hier gemaakt wordt? Zeker. Um, hè, we zijn er dus dankzij uh, de persgroep... we zitten in het gebouw van, uh, van de persgroep Volkskrant Trouw Parool... hebben we nu een echte newsroom weer... Um, en kunnen we ons werk weer doen. Ja. Maar ik begrijp dat Rusland er alles aan doet... via DDoS-aanvallen... Ja. Ja. om de computerlijnen, om het signaal ja. kapot te maken... Nee. Nee, het is om de een... berichtgeving stop te zetten. Ja, dus het is een constante oorlog. Hè. Uh, uh, TV Rain zendt uit via YouTube. Dat is eigenlijk een van de weinige kanalen die nog open zijn. Uh, wij, Moscow Times, Medusa en anderen... Uh, hebben natuurlijk onze website. Maar die worden allemaal geblokkeerd in Rusland... Want die worden, we worden hier in Nederland heel erg aangevallen hè, met die DDoS attacks. Uh, in Rusland zijn die sites geblokkeerd, maar via VPNs, dat zijn speciale apps, uh, kunnen mensen daar toch toegang toe krijgen. En dat gebeurt. En dat gebeurt. Miljoenen mensen kijken naar de show van, uh, van Misha en van Julia. Ja. Uh, miljoenen mensen lezen onze site. Dus er is een enorme honger aan dit soort informatie... omdat ze natuurlijk dood worden gegooid met propaganda. Julia, there was an incident uh, this week uh, with TV Rain. One of your colleague anchors uh, was talking about supporting the Russian troops in uh, Ukraine. And um, this, uh, you also have station in uh, Latvia. And there the government decided, okay, this, is, this goes too far. We're going to kill the station and uh, you can't broadcast anymore from this country. What went wrong there? You know, I just, uh, I, I, I cannot say a lot, but I just uh, can say that it was a mistake. It was a big mistake, uh, unacceptable, and uh, the channel apologized. Yeah. Apologized several times. And Michael, is, is the station still, TV Rain uh, cannot broadcast anymore now from Latvia? As I understand, I mean, I'm also, I'm not in, in Latvia, but as far as I understand, yes, it's, uh, it's uh, out of, uh, it's shut down in, in cables. Yeah, and were you shocked when you heard what, what was happening? Well, I was of course uh, very um, very sad about it. Mm. Because I'm, I'm mentioning is because you um, uh, talked to the Russian audience about the soldiers going into Ukraine and telling them uh, what could happen and that they should not go. Let's let's listen to what you said. И многие люди покорно идут в военкоматы, идут на смерть. Потому что так понимают свой долг, потому что деды воевали, потому что уклоняться нечестно и недостойно, потому что сказали, потому что так надо. На самом деле так не надо. Никто не нападал на Россию в несправедливой захватнической войне, которую развязало твое правительство. И долг, и доблесть, и достоинство, наоборот, заключается в том, чтобы громко и четко сказать «нет» этой жестокой власти, которая хочет отправить тебя на смерть. Сказать «нет» и не идти. You say to young Russians, don't go to the trenches. But they have to, right? Is there even a choice for young people not to go to Ukraine? Since the mobilization started, uh, since Putin announced mobilization in the end of September, this mm -hmm. is no longer a choice. And uh, young men across Russia are forced to join the military. The situation is terrible, as we just heard from John Sweeney in Bakhmut. It's, it's just a killing machine. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible situation. Just, you know, the Misha, Misha's position was uh, clear. Uh, so, uh, and uh, he asked uh, Russian young people not to go to fight, not to go to kill the people in Ukraine. And the, the, these, these, that John Sweeney was talking about, the, the, they are 
killed daily on a daily basis now, now in Bakhmut. They are pu pushed forward by, by Wagner group uh, to, um, they, they, they are on the, on the front lines and they die every day. Yeah. TV Rain mag dus nu Dirk Sauer niet meer uitzenden vanuit uh, uh, Letland. Hoe groot is dat probleem voor de zender, voor het bereik van de zender, voor de inkomsten? Want er moet ook geld verdiend worden. Ja, het is, het is een groot probleem, omdat uh, de kabelinkomsten zijn eigenlijk de belangrijkste inkomsten. De advertentieinkomsten zijn natuurlijk sowieso weg. Uh, dus het is een financieel probleem. Uh, en, het is, uh, en ze hebben natuurlijk uh, een, uh, een flink team nog in Latvia... Um, en die proberen we natuurlijk nu zoveel mogelijk naar Amsterdam uh, te halen. Uh, en godzijdank is, uh, functioneert de studio in Amsterdam uh, wel. En die gaat gewoon door. Kijk, en wat heel belangrijk is om uit te leggen is... Uh, één journalist heeft iets onhandigs gezegd. En dat had hij ook niet eens zo bedoeld. Want natuurlijk wil Dorst de oorlog niet steunen. He, alles wat Dorst de afgelopen twintig uh, jaar gedaan heeft, is juist... Tegen Poetin, tegen deze oorlog. Um, maar die journalisten zijn, het is een hele jonge groep mensen onder een enorme stress. Alles gaat live. Uh, mensen zijn dag en nacht aan het werk. En iemand heeft gewoon iets onhandig geformuleerd. En in Latvia is daar uh, om politieke redenen gebruik van gemaakt. Uh, wat je natuurlijk goed moet realiseren, Latvia is maar een heel Letland, sorry, Letland. Is maar, het is maar een klein landje en sinds de start van de oorlog zijn daar tienduizenden, misschien wel honderdduizenden Russen naartoe getrokken. Dat heeft tot politieke spanningen binnen Letland geleid. Ja. Er zijn net verkiezingen geweest. Uh, een van de belangrijkste thema's was de aanwezigheid van al die Russen. En er waren een aantal partijen die zeiden, we moeten al die Russen het land uitgooien. En dat speelt allemaal een rol bij deze En dat speelt een rol bij deze bezetting. Dit heeft eigenlijk niets te maken met... Dorst met TV Rain. Dit heeft te maken met de interne politieke verhoudingen in Letland. Ja. En daar is deze zin er helaas een, een, het slachtoffer van. En het is nu natuurlijk heel wrang dat op de dag dat uh, Misha tot foreign agent wordt verklaard... Uh, 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 in, in Letland uh, TV Rain zijn licentie verliest. Dus een notabene een EU-land. Ja. Uh, dus je ziet, uh, uh, het is, zit allemaal heel ingewikkeld en het toont ook aan... De moeilijke positie van Russische journalisten. Want in, in, in Nederland en in, in andere landen. In nou ja, in Nederland is het godzijdank eigenlijk heel goed. Maar uh, heel veel journalisten zitten bijvoorbeeld ook in Georgië. Mm. Misha mag Georgië niet in. Your parents are in, in Georgia, right? My parents are in Georgia, yes. Yeah. So you can visit them, why not? Why can you not go to Georgia? I was not let to enter Georgia. That was um, that was early March. That was a few days after 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 we we had to leave uh, leave Russia. What you told told the story yeah. story already. And uh, we ended up first in Baku, and then we wanted to to join our uh, my family in in Belize. But I was not let into the country and turned back and had to fly back to Baku. Yeah. You are now living in, in Amsterdam, as I said, with your daughter, who's five years old. Uh, what, do you, what kind of future do you see in this city? And how difficult is it to transplant yourself and your work from Moscow to Amsterdam? I know, but uh, Misha told you that technically uh, the changes in our work are not so so important. So it's just uh, it was just difficult to find your voice, to understand how to keep in touch with the Russian news or something like that. It's the, uh, you know that uh, I try to explain to my daughter, <laughs> to our daughter, that it is a long journey. It's uh, it's an adventure. <laughs> so she left Moscow for Baku and then and then 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 and. Uh, um, she likes Amsterdam. She likes a city with with boats. <laughs> but does uh, she? I mean, she has to learn a new language, yeah. probably. Yeah, Dutch is better oh, than ours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she's, she sings uh, Dutch songs already. Uh, but it's difficult for her to express herself in a new language. It's, yeah. it's, but she likes uh, the surrounding. Can you ever go back to Moscow, uh, doing what you do here in the Netherlands? Oh, it's. Uh, um, I, yeah, um, we can't. Uh, we can't we, uh, until until this war ends. For, for me, as I understand this war, uh, war means Putin, and Putin means war. And uh, and bef and uh, um, under Putin, under this political regime, we I really doubt we will be able to to return. We cannot but return. I, but I think that 
he already lost the war. And uh, yes, well, it may last yet, but still, his days are numbered. Yeah, but it's still, it's also a harsh reality for you that you are basically confined in Europe here in Amsterdam and you cannot go back to the place where you want to be and where you want to report and you want to work and live. For me, it's crucial. Uh, absolutely. Since I, when I, when I restarted my, my, my show, when I restarted doing what I, what I did before, when I found my, my voice again, I'm still struggling with my identity, but I found my voice again. And for me, since then, it's crucial to work, to bring this war back to Russia, to try to break this propaganda bubble that the uh, Russian nation is in, and to, uh, to talk about this war, to bring truth about it to, to Russia, to explain to Russians what uh, their government is doing with Ukraine, what means this terror is bringing up, upon Ukraine. And that basically is what all my life is about now. I don't see, I, I don't have any other um, life beside, beside it. Yes, we live in Amsterdam, our, our kid goes to, goes to school around the corner and it's very uh, comfortable and, and as I said, Amsterdam is a very friendly city, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is what we do. Thank you so much for being here today. I know you have to rush off because you have a live show any exactly, minute to start exactly, now from exactly, uh, for yes. TV Russia. Absolutely. So, Michael, Julia, thank you so much. And Dirk Sauer, thank you so much for coming to Buitenhof today. Thanks a million. Bedankt voor het kijken. Vond je dit een goed gesprek? Vergeet dan niet te abonneren. Een like of een reactie achterlaten kan natuurlijk ook. Of bekijk een van de andere interviews op dit kanaal.